was asked several times uh, if I had read a particular book. And to be honest with you, when I first heard about it, uh, it did not interest me that much. It was just, uh, I, I didn't know much about the author and I didn't know much about the book, but after several people uh, had asked me if I'd read it, I thought I would, I would try and read it. And um, it has, I think, one of the most fascinating titles. It's Jesus and John Wayne and how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. Now, one of the things I want to share with you at this time is the author of this is a very conservative Christian. In fact, she would check off all of the boxes of being evangelical herself, although she does not use that term, evangelical. Uh, the, uh, the author, uh, Dumay, uh, is the professor of history and culture at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, and she is an active member of the Christian Reformed Church. So she's not, uh, what I wanted to do is make sure that we didn't have people who already had a, something out for evangelicals and they were just going to try and do a hatchet job. But when I got started, I, I don't know if you, remember those old card files you used to go through? You know, I'd, I'd be studying at the university. I go through and I pick out a book I wanted. And then I look at the cards all around it be, and find out some a better book than I was looking for. Well, I didn't find a better book, but I found some interesting ones. Um, this one is Believe Me, The Evangelical Road to Donald Trump. And he is a practicing evangelical. He is, and you can tell he is the professor of history at Messiah College in Pennsylvania, and he is, it belongs to a large evangelical church and is himself, I will, you know, again, a practicing evangelical, and he's looking back at it. The other one is Robert P. Jones, who wrote a book about uh, uh, the death of white e evangelicalism in America, and he also is a graduate of Southern Baptist College and a graduate of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and received his PhD, I think it is, at Yale. Again, somebody who comes out of the evangelical uh, conservative mold. Then there's Catherine Stewart, who uh, wrote a book called Power Worshippers. Uh, and she is a reporter who is a longtime student of uh, evangelical uh, thought, and so comes at it with a, a much more of an academic look. And Sarah Posner, also an American journalist, uh, wrote a book uh, called Unholy uh, about how uh, Trump uh, came into office. Uh, the professor, Robert Jones, is a CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, and you're lucky you're going to see a lot of graphs. And, uh, well, maybe you're not lucky, but you're going to see a lot of graphs anyway uh, uh, about uh, how we ended up where we are. So you've got, if you've got a handout, you've got those books in, in the handout if you want to uh, uh, follow through on them. A couple of things. Uh, I'm not going to use the term evangelical. Uh, I, am, I am deliberately and consciously not going to use that term, or I may slip and use it, but I'm trying not to, because evangelical is an extremely broad category of people of all different theological and political positions, of all different colors, and uh, all across the world. And I don't want anyone to get the opinion that if I'm talking about evangelicals, I'm talking about all evangelicals. I don't want this to become an identity the politics sort of thing where we're naming evangelicals. What I am going to be doing is talking about uh, 
evangelical Christian nationalist. That's a kind of a subcategory of evangelical. So I'll be talking about Christian nationalists more than uh, talking about uh, uh, some other uh, some other things. I'm looking through here, and somebody changed my probably me changed my uh, papers here. One of the things that I also want to talk to you about is the fact that we hear a lot about abortion being the central issue for many evangelicals. Uh, I want to tell you that it is not, has not been. It is only very recently that evangelicals have become concerned about abortion. In the 1960s, the late 1960s, the Southern Baptist Convention, one of the very most conservative uh, conventions in the Christian church, uh, voted on more than one occasion uh, to have uh, abortion become legal in the United States. Now, they didn't want abortion on demand. They said that they wanted abortion for in case of rape, incest, and damage to the fetus or the mother. So the Southern Baptist Convention on more than one occasion uh, voted up until about 1973, uh, and they actually praised Roe v. Wade when it came out, okay? The other thing is there is a magazine, I don't know if you're familiar with it, called Christianity Today. It is the premier magazine of the evangelical church founded, I think, by Billy Graham back a long time ago. And one of the interesting things about this is that they wrote in the, I think it was the early 70s, a long series of articles uh, talking about how we had to be careful how we judged abortion because it was a very complicated issue. They themselves did not come out against um, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, they said it had to be used wisely. They were certainly against abortion on demand, but they again also were saying there may be reasons why when abortion might happen. So up until about 1975, uh, there was this debate going on in the evangelical community, and it was not clear uh, that they were anti-Roe v. Wade. As a matter of fact, many of their arms and organizations uh, said that this is a good thing. We're getting the government out of health. Uh, so, uh, so when you go back, you have to be careful that you don't say evangelicals always, because evangelicals did not always oppose abortion uh, it, through their large uh, organizations. So how did we end up getting uh, abortion as the main, one of the main issues. What we'll find out is that there was another Supreme Court ruling that had to do with the taxation of religious organizations and the fact that they had to desegregate. And there was a reaction to the desegregation that it was meaning that all white schools we're not going to be tax exempt. And so that started the strong movement that we have today uh, of right wing politics. It was to keep white Southern schools white after the Brown decision where they had to be desegregated. One of the things that happened throughout the South and in the North is uh, all white academies came up. And those all-white academies uh, were tax-exempt. And there was a ruling by the Supreme Court that you, if you were not integrated, then you could not be tax-exempt because it violated uh, standard IRS code. And uh, that really got uh, this started. And as it began to roll, what happened was they found out that that was not a good issue because it was harder to say we wanted to be an all-white school or an all-white uh, 
if you understand what I mean. Uh, and so what happened was uh, they started looking for another uh, social issue that they could use to pin their views on. And what they, they picked abortion for two reasons. One is that it has a high emotional impact. And number two, uh, they could bring conservative Catholics on board and create a wider, bigger political uh, machine than they could going with the desegregation. And so it was at least a semi-conscious thing to move from all white academies and segregation and taxation to abortion. So they draw the Catholics in and they have a highly emotional issue. When polls are done of evangelicals, abortion comes uh, and they list the top 20 things that evangelicals are concerned with. Significantly over and over again, abortion comes in about number 13, 12 or 13 on a regular basis. So when you ask evangelicals where their, where their priorities lie, abortion actually comes down the list. Uh, now that doesn't mean that, there aren't, that they're not opposed to it. It does not mean uh, that, they're, uh, that there aren't people who are really sincerely devoted to that position, but it means if you take a broad look at slice across, they're more concerned, Bill, about business and taxation and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and that has been proven poll after poll after poll. The other thing that I want to share with you is the election of Trump was not an abnormal thing. All of these books that I have read point to the fact that Trump is the tip of the spear that this has been coming for about 40 or 50 years, and it is pointed, and Trump is not, they did not elect Trump holding their nose. They elected Trump because they thought he was the person that God had sent. And they knew exactly what they were doing. And poll after poll and study after study says that, that this is not something uh, that's different. There are three things that center around this, and they all start with keeping. The first one is keeping American Christian. Now, that has two assumptions. Number one, that it is a Christian nation. And number two, that somehow it has fallen away from that and needs to be brought back. And so God is calling you to bring the United States back into a Christian nation. And the only way you can do that is by keeping American family strong. And so there is within this Christian nationalism, a real strong emphasis on patriarchy within the family. And then if you have strong families and if you're working to keep the nation Christian, the third thing is you want the nation to be secure. And so you need strong men to keep the nation secure. And so the kind of the center goals of them are those three things, keeping uh, the United States Christian, keeping the family strong, and keeping the nation secure. Having taught religion at Alpena Community College for 15 years, uh, generally, scholars say that this is not a Christian nation. It was founded by Christians, but it, it is, you know, there's nothing in our founding documents that would say that this is a Christian nation. And many of our founders were not Christian. Uh, they were deists or uh, agnostics or uh, Unitarians. Uh, there are several uh flavors of the of the early founding fathers. Um, and and so to say that even all of our founding fathers, and they were all men, if you want to do that, uh, were Christian is also not true. Also, of our first group of presidents, we had three presidents who were not Christian. They were Unitarian. Can we safely say that we were founded with the belief that God, though, rather than Christianity? 
Well, some of the founding fathers were atheists. Oh, uh, can we say that all of the, that we were found with the belief in God? You can say, I think that there, most of them were Christian and most of them had beliefs, uh, but they worded things very uh, carefully. For example, in the Declaration of Independence, you use the word creator. And creator is a deist uh, term, uh, and it it does not necessarily reflect the the Christian God. And you probably all know of the Jefferson Bible, where Jefferson cut out all of the miracles of Jesus, the virgin birth, and the resurrection. He didn't believe in any of those. And George Washington never was confirmed and never took communion. Uh, so. They, they, I'm not saying they didn't believe in God because Jefferson was probably a deist, but uh, uh, he, you have to push it pretty hard to say he rejected many of the traditional uh, Christian uh, uh, beliefs. The other thing is that Is there something that you see in their writings over and over again called the seven mountains or the seven pillars? And as I was doing reading in this, there were uh, many books and many articles written by Christian nationalists who say that the goal is to have dominion over the seven pillars or dominion over the seven mountains. Well, what are those seven mountains or pillars. And they are uh, to be claimed for Christ, religion, the family, the government, education, the media, entertainment, and business. And all of those have to be brought under the dominion of Christ. And when you say dominion, that is a strong uh, well, dominion is dominion. You be dominion over those things, um, and no, no, it's not in the, that that packet. The control or the dominion of Christ, and when you do that, it is the dominion of a particular understanding of who Christ is, and we'll be looking at it when we a little bit later and we will find out. So a couple of other things that is important. 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump in the 2016 election. 81%. That means that 19% didn't. And so you have to be careful again that you're not doing a broad sweep. But 81% is a significantly high number. Now, if you're if you voted for Trump and he's your person, that's a good thing. And I suppose if and I'm just stating that as a fact. But the thing you have to realize is that 57 percent of all mainline Christians voted for Trump. White mainline Christians. The key category there is white. 81 percent of white evangelicals voted for Trump and 57% of white mainline churches, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, voted for. So both the mainline churches and the evangelical churches voted a majority uh, uh, for Trump. So you can't simply say, look at all those evangelicals over here, what they did. There's 57% of mainline churches that did exactly uh, the, same, the same thing. And so it's important, pardon? Uh, it's important for us to know that. The key issue there is the descriptive term, white. That was one of the most determinative things. If you were a black evangelical, it was flipped around with only 10 or 15% voting for Trump. Uh, so... The key is it's, it's just not evangelicals, it is white evangelicals and white mainline Protestants. Also, I don't know what the percentage is, Carrie, but uh, 
white Catholics also voted in the majority uh, for Trump. So one of the determining factors, if you vote for Trump or not, was your whiteness. Now, we'll be getting into that uh, much more uh, uh, closely. Uh, like I said, I want to stay away from identity politics. Now, here's, I'm going to go through some charts very fast. And the reason I'm doing this, because it, it sets the stage of some of the concerns that are happening. These are all done by the Public uh, Religion Resource Institute. And there are several uh, of these uh, studies, and they both, most of them come out with exactly about the same thing. One of the things that has happened to the United States right now, and this is, you may have this chart in the back of your, uh, I handed some in, so hopefully some of you have them, but 53, 43% is the number of white Protestants in the United States right now. Did anyone see the importance of that? 43%. That's the first time we know that that has dipped below 50%. Yeah, it is, it is 43% of the people in the United States are now white Protestants. Look at this one here. This is 24%. Those are non-affiliated. People who have no affiliation with any uh, church or denomination. That is very, very low. That used to be up in the 80, late high 80s or low 90s. Uh, and we'll show you another graph that shows that. And then another 24% are uh, Protestants of, of, of color. Now, how does that happen? Here's another chart. Can you see this? You got another chart? This is us, 65 and over. If any of you is under 65, I'm sorry. I, I, I did that. But if you look at this, 64% of people, white people in the country over uh, 64 or 64 percent period of all people had some denominational affiliation, and only 12 percent. Uh, uh, this was done uh, three years ago. So if you were over 65, 64 percent of you, the odds are you belong to some form of Christian church. Uh, if you were Non-white, 16% of the population were churched. 4% were, I don't know, and 12% were unaffiliated. Now, if you notice, this begins to change. This is the number of uh, white Christians by age, 65 and over. 64%, okay? If you're between 50 and 64, that drops down to 53%. If you're between 30 and 49, it drops down to 36%. And if you're 18 to 29, it drops down to 25%. So this looks just like a stepping stone. I mean, you if you did it like this, it would be a nice, well, I guess you could do this. It's, it's a stairway. And it is a clear stairway. There is, uh, this has been produced by lots of folks. It, it is just important for us to understand that white Christians, many of us are feeling we're losing control. Our kids are not going to church. Uh, our, uh, uh, you know, our culture is, is changing and it's changing very rapidly. Uh, and so right now, if you notice, 25% of those 18 to 29 and 12% up here were unaffiliated. So that, that, is a, that is a dramatic, dramatic change. So the orange and the top of that 
that started, but the younger age group that was unaffiliated? Uh, uh, yeah, unaffiliated right there. That's the orange. 12%, and now it's 38%. So it's, it, it is in this age group right now, 38% of uh, 18 to 29 year olds are non-affiliated where only 12% of, uh, of us older people are unaffiliated. The other thing that has shaken things up and shaken them up mightily is uh, any of you shocked when the Supreme Court said that uh, same-sex marriage was approved. Uh, in 2004, 2004, 32% of Americans supported same-sex marriage, 32%. 59% were opposed. Now that's 2004, which is you know, fairly, fairly recently. In 2016, it flip-flopped. 59% are in favor of same-sex marriage and 43% are opposed. So do you see that, that chart? Do you see what, is, what has happened? And that has all happened since 2014, uh, which if, if you have a significant theological position that you were opposing same-sex marriage, you lost that battle. And, and your pardon? Uh, 2016 is the latest I have. It's the latest I have. Although what I understand and what I read, what, what I was reading, that has gone higher. It, it, is, it, is, it is higher than that now. It has not dipped down at all. It has gone higher. Here is what's happening with Christianity. Remember this, the, the young people were really not affiliated. Here's a chart. The blue line are white Catholics. Okay, that's his bottom line, are white Catholics. White Catholics have lost, but at a very slow rate, uh, but their denomination or their, their faith grouping has not because of an influx of uh, people uh, from uh, Latin countries who are, uh, in fact, I don't know, I read somewhere where there are more non-white Catholics than there are white Catholics now, at least in certain regions of the country. The yellow line is... Uh, white mainline Protestants. And it, it, you can see it is a steady drop down from about 20% down to 12%. So that's an eight point loss. 12% of the overall population? Yes, yeah. We're talking about white, yeah, yeah. And uh, white evangelical Protestants stayed pretty well, but they've gone down and they have taken a tremendous drop the last few years in 20, it wasn't long ago, just a few years ago, the Southern Baptists reported that they lost 200,000 members in one year. And they're the largest grouping of of Protestant, they lost 200,000 in one year, the biggest drop percentage wise and number wise they've ever had. And now evangelical churches are reporting the same thing that white mainline Protestant churches have been reporting is that now there is a steeper and steeper drop. And there, whereas the white mainline Protestant churches are now leveling off where they are, the uh, Evangelical churches are going down to meet uh, those mainline churches. Uh, uh, the young people. The young people just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it, the most of it, but not all of it, but most of it. Um, this, I think, is the most fascinating of charts. Uh, 
roughly 48% of the total American population, just under 50%, feel that we're doing better now than we were in 1950. The question was asked, are we better off now than we were in 1950? And you had to just answer yes or no, okay? Over here on the far left, 60%, 66% of Democrats said we're better off. 66% of non-affiliated, non-church going, said that they were, we were doing better. 65% of Hispanic Catholics said that we're doing better. Uh, black non-Hispanic, 62%. Hispanic, 47, and white, college-educated, 56. Now, those are the ones that all are on the plus side that we're doing better. As you move over here, it becomes less and less. Age 65 and over, or excuse me, white non-Hispanics drop down to 43. Age 65 and over, uh, 42. White mainline Protestants, that's the first time we hit a, 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 a Protestant group, white mainline Protestants are at 41%. Uh, white Catholics are at 41%. Carrie, we're, we're tied. Um, white working class, 34%. Republicans, 31% and white evangelical Protestants, 25%. So what you see is over here, you have Democrats and unaffiliated, all of them pushing 70%, think we're doing better. Go far over here, Republicans and white evangelical Protestants, 25 to 30%. So do you see the Op, they're literally at opposite ends of the poles. Uh, and, and when you look at the divisions now, this, I think, at least speaks to what those divisions might be. If you're all the way over here, things are not going well at all, and you need to turn things around. If you're over here, things are maybe not perfect, but they're, they're, they're better, and they're headed in the right direction. Democrats at one end, Republicans at the other, non-affiliated at one end, white evangelicals on the other. So I think the next one is also, I hope you find this interesting. I don't know what's uh, the next one I find fascinating. The question was asked in 2011, and then again in 2016, after the election, or when the election of Trump occurred. In 2011, evangelicals said at a 44% rate that a, a president had to be morally, morally straight. Morality had a, an impact on it. Uh, that's all Americans in 2011. In 2016, it was 61%. So as Trump came onto the stage, the number of people, remember with, uh, with uh, Bill Clinton and all of that, you know, personal, sexual was important. And, uh, and so more people thought it was important to have uh, a person who was morally uh, correct in yeah Trump effect on white right Christians political ethics these are white white evangelicals in 2011 scored exactly like you would expect them to score they're value voters right so they were at 30 percent thought that you could have a, a president who was maybe not morally uh, uh, perfect. 
But in 2016, it went up to 72%. So white evangelicals grow more ex accepting of politicians in personal indiscretions. That was the biggest jump anywhere. It went from 30% to 72%. <clears throat> more accepting of politicians with personal indiscretions. Like Bill Clinton. Okay? That, they were way down on him because he had a moral indiscretion. And you say, well, how come they were accepting of Trump? Well, because their idea that the morality of the president was of high importance went from 30% to 72% uh, in a matter of five years. Yeah. And then white mainline Protestants didn't escape this either. They were at 38% wanted their president to be morally uh, upright or whatever you want to call it. That went to 60%. Catholics went from 42 to 58. An unaffiliated state about flat from 60 through three. They're the only group that dipped down to 60 so what I'm trying to do is, is show you a, a, a picture of what churches are facing and what they're seeing and what pressure is being put on them uh, from the outside. And I will lay you odds, if none of you knew any of those percentage, you all knew that churches were shrinking. I mean, it's not something that you say, oh, my God, I didn't know that. You might have know, not known the, uh, what I'm saying is the pressure is there, even if you don't know the exact uh, statistics of it. Most people my age know that our children are not going to church. Okay. They are not uh, participating in service clubs, organizations, or in yeah, yeah. Uh, I, they're they're really unaffiliated in a lot of things, and but that that is, I'm only looking at the church and how it, in, it impacts the church. But I know when I talk to Boy Scout leaders and I talk to uh, uh, service clubs, service clubs are no longer the Masons is, are pretty well dead. Uh, uh, I don't know of anybody that's is joining the Masons. When I was in Lewiston, um, why the pressure put on me, even though you're not supposed to ask to join the Mason was, was great. Uh, since I've been here, nobody has thought to uh, uh, ask me at all. Um, and this is, this is more of the background. From 1945 to 1960, Okay, 19, the end of the war until 1960, churches grew by 30%. So you have this movement upwards as the churches grow. And when I was at seminary in, in the 60s, uh, people were adding on. Uh, churches were, were all, at least staying flat, if not growing. Uh, denominations were... Uh, solid. One of the things with a non-affiliated that has happened is denominations now, Gene, I don't know how you feel, but denominations now are almost unimportant. They're irrelevant. When I first got here, I was, I'm the Congregational United Church of Christ. Most people who came were in that ballpark in terms of their uh, faith history. When I left, and that was 20 years ago, God, uh, people would come and move into town and they say, well, I'm going to the Presbyterian church and I'm going to the Lutheran church and I'm going to the congregational church. And then it's more pick or choose, kind of a buffet. And you kind of figured out who the pastor is you like the best and you settled in there. It had nothing to do with theology or very little to do with theology. It had to do with socialization 
Do you feel comfortable with the people in that church? Do you feel comfortable with that pastor? Do they, if I've got kids, do they have the right youth programs for my kids? And, and so it was more pick or choose. And so I had Roman Catholics joining the Congregational Church and Congregationalists going to the Catholic Church. I mean, uh, which which 20 years earlier would would not have happened. So from 1945 to 1960, the attendance grew by 30%. Now we begin to get in to where for the evangelicals, or I'm going to call them Christian nationalists, everything is going their way. President Eisenhower was given a drafted message by the National Association of Evangelicals, the NAE, in 19, well, when he was a president, what was that, 1952, something like that. And in that, it proclaimed the United States of America has been founded on the principles of the Holy Bible. That's a mother load, right? Eisenhower signed a statement. Now, it's not official because it didn't go through Congress. It didn't do that. But he signed a National Association of Evangelical Statement that the United States was founded on biblical, the Holy Bible. Victory. 1954. I remember this. I was at Nolan, or no, I was at Greenfield Union uh, uh, Elementary School. And in the 50s, and we were called to an assembly, and we were taught that we were changing the Pledge of Allegiance, and we were adding one nation under God. Now, some of you, uh, some of us are old enough to remember exactly. So I, we all relearned the pledge on that day. So it was in 1954, under God was put into the pledge. To this day, I don't say that. I, I could tell you the history of the pledge, and you would know why I, I, I will not say that. Not because I don't believe in God. In 1957, in God We Trust was added to coins and currency. So, and there was a movement to change the United States from e pluribus unum, out of many, one, to changing it to one nation under God, in God we trust. Now see the change that's happening psychologically. You're moving from e pluribus unum to in God we trust. And that's all relatively new stuff, right? Right? Uh, in the 50s, the churches are growing. You get the statement from Eisenhower. You get the uh, one nation under God. Uh, you get the in God we trust. Everything is going your way. And the churches are growing. Historian Daniel K. Williams wrote, while politicians in the 50s and 60s bolstered American civil religion, and that's when I was at seminary. I know they, we talked about civil religion a lot, you know, that, that not necessarily Christianity, but, but there was a civil religion out there that people participated in. Uh, I have found out, and, I, and to show you this, uh, I don't know if you've ever had churches that have had this issue, but I, I could probably do a whole lot of things in the church and, and maybe get into a little trouble, but try and take the American flag out of the sanctuary. <laughs> right, Dean? Yeah. Right? I remember when I was at the congregational church, I got in trouble because the eagle was turned the wrong way on the top of the flag. Uh, we have a sister church in Germany who would come over. They'd walk into our sanctuary every time. Every time I, I put my hand on the book. Um, and the first thing they would say was, what's a flag doing in here? God loves all nations. God loves all people. He came for the world. What do you, what do, you do with a flag in here? And they're very sensitive because that's what happened during Nazi Germany is that they, 
it started flying flags everywhere to show that they were approved by the church. And so when they see that, they really just, and I mean, every time I knew I was going to get asked that question, what's the flag doing here? And I ask that question all the time too. Not that I don't love the United States. I do. But what's that got to do with? Okay. So everything is moving in the right direction. Equating religious faith with patriotism. Those two come together in the 50s and 60s. So you have patriotism and faith nudging up against one another. But while the politicians are going like this, the Supreme Court is doing this. Okay. So in 1947, evangelicals had supported separation of church and state. They wanted to make sure the church was state. It was very interesting. There is a, a senator, I looked for the book, but I think I got rid of it when I retired. Um, there was a book written by a lawyer, and it was a fascinating book. Uh, and it said that... Uh, uh, you know, mail used to be delivered on Sundays. Now, this book was written when Sunday deliveries had stopped. And a Baptist senator from Georgia stood on the floor of the United States Senate and said, we should be delivering mail on Sunday because there's a total separation of church and state. And what about Jews? What about, you know, uh, uh, you know why would you hollow out Sunday and not hollow out other sacred days. And that was a Baptist senator from, from Georgia that did that. There was this real sense that the separation of church and state was something that was important among evangelical uh, uh, Christians. What they wanted to do was not to allow public money to be used to bus Catholic students to parochial schools. Okay. And the Supreme Court said, you can use it. You can use state money to bus Catholic kids to Catholic schools. And they were very upset by that. In 1962, Engel versus Vitale. The case brought by the New York Board of Regents regarding prayer composed by the board and required to be recited at the start of each day. Uh, it's very important you understand that the way that's worded. Nobody took prayer out of the public schools. You pray all you want in the public schools. The school can't write a prayer and make you say it. Okay, so when people say, well, they've taken God out of the public schools, I'd like to know somebody who's powerful enough to take God out of anywhere. I mean, you stop and think about that. That's that's you ain't got much of a God if <laughs> if you can do that. Uh, and I, my statement always is, as long as there's math, there's going to be prayer in public schools. Uh, you just can't write a prayer. And have it said, when I was at Nolan Junior High School, every morning we started our class with uh, the Lord's Prayer. Public school, Nolan Junior High School, public school in Detroit. That was a mess. Carrie, you guys don't say the Lord's Prayer like we do. You drop off the whole ending of it. Oh, do you? Well, at that time, you dropped off that whole ending. So we'd be going along saying the Lord's Prayer, and all the Catholics would stop, and the Protestants would go on. And then we would want, then we would trip over, well, is it trespasses? Is it debtors? Is it sin? What is it? You know, and, and it became a joke. I mean, it, it was, okay, who's up there? Is he, is he going to do the Catholic prayer or the, tres, the Methodist trespass? Or is he going to do the real one that uses debtors? Uh, uh, but, but, I mean, that was required. God was not taken out of public schools. Prayer was not taken. One of the problems is the newspapers ran with that as God taken out of the schools. Not true. But anyway, that's a loss. That's a significant loss. 
Uh, I remember uh, I had one of my kids graduate from the high school here. And uh, a couple of people came to me and said they were really upset uh, because they didn't have a prayer before the graduation. So I asked the uh, principal, and he said, well, we've never, we've never had prayer <laughs> before graduation. <laughs> we didn't take it out. I, I don't ever remember it being in. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it depends where you're standing. Uh, so that was a, a, a blow. And then uh, in 1963, they, uh, Abington versus Shrimp, decided that you could not require Bible reading in the public school. I think that was a pretty wise decision. I mean, whose Bible, which translations, which verses, <laughs> you know, it, it, could, it could be, uh, there could be some pretty, Bible's got all sorts of different verses in it. I wouldn't, you know, uh, and, and so who's going to read it? Who's going to, who's going to select it? Who, which Bible are you going to use? The NIV and the NJV, the RSV, the CEB, uh, the N, you know, which, which translation are you going to use? I mean, and, and so they said, again, does not prevent you from reading the Bible in school. It prevents required reading in public schools. Then another big one hit, and this, and that is the Hart Seller Act. Now, this is not a Supreme Court decision. This is an act of Congress, which changed the immigration and nationalization policy of the United States. Up until then, our immigration policy favored individual countries from Europe. And so most immigrants coming into the United States came from Europe. It was highly weighted, not to the east and not, not uh, out further west, but to Europe. That didn't mean there wasn't any. It was heavily weighted that way. What this did is it did away with um, uh, quotas for countries and they went to regions and so uh, they would have a European region uh, 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 Oriental region uh, you know I, I don't know exactly what the region but they went with regions and so there were a ton more of non-European people of color now moving into the United States and that's a big change. Then we began to think, okay, we're going to become a non-white nation pretty soon. What, what, I don't know what the year is now. It's 2030, 2040, something like that. We, there will be more non-white non -whites in the United States and whites, Caucasians will become the minority. So you've lost those decisions. And now you see this group of immigrants coming and you realize that someday you're going to be in the minority. And so you want to push back and make sure that doesn't happen because this is our country. And, uh, well, you, you get the idea. Now, as late as 1973, there was a Chicago declaration written by the evangelicals. And what it said was that the Christian church is committed to social justice, opposes materialism, seeks economic equality, opposes militarism and sexism, and was in favor of some form of a woman's right. Now, those are evangelicals in 1973. So, so you have to be careful when you, when you label these because some of the most progressive Christians in the 1800s and the early 1900s were evangelicals who opposed slavery, 
so you have to be careful with a with a broad broad brush. But as late as 1977, 1973, in the Chicago Declaration, uh, there was this uh, still that remnant of evangelicals. What has happened is there has been a embrace of militant masculinity. And I'm going to go real fast here. There's something called sage con, S-A-G-E con, C-O-N. S-A-G is in capital letters, capital C-O-N. And what that means is spiritually active, governance engaged conservatives. Okay, that's a, a group. Uh, the Barner Group, which is a polling group, a religious polling group, claims that the people who elected Trump were the sage cons, the spiritually active governance engaged conservatives. And they were allowed to do that for three reasons. One is gerrymandering, which waits any given district. And so if you have a small group of very active, committed people, they can change a, a district fairly easily. Also, uh, excuse me, let me find this again, primaries. Primaries are the same thing because most people don't vote in primaries. So if you vote in a primary, your vote is going to be heavily weighted. And so if you have a really committed group, we see this right now. People are afraid to say things because not because they'll lose the general election, but because they'll be primaried. And so they're, they're, they're taking stances that they may not have otherwise taken, but if they want to remain in office, they have to get through the primaries. And so if you have an extremely dedicated group, liberal, conservative, whatever, but the conservatives are much, much better organized, they can swing an election very quickly. And the Electoral College. And the Electoral College was, of course, put in there so that slave states had some weighted uh, have as much authority as, as some of the non-slave states. And that still works that way. Sage cons rep number, they say 10% of the population, but put Trump over the edge to win the election. They boast 100 members in Congress, both in the House and Senate, and almost 1,000 state officials in 33 states. Here's some real quick. There's a group called United in Purpose. United in Purpose is a polling agency that has amassed files on the entire voting population. Okay. You're uh, probably everyone in this room is in their files. They were data mining and they were part of the Cambridge Analytica, if you remember that. And what they did was uh, what they do is they, there are, uh, let me go one more. This one is the one that upsets me. According to the Center on Media and Democracy, by November 2018, the Koch brothers funded I-360 program, had personality profiles on 89% of the US population. And so what is happening is oftentimes there, there are, we'll get into this a little later, people who literally travel throughout the country stopping at churches, small churches, not medium churches, large churches, and they get the pastors and they give them voting information on their congregation. 
And they tell them they want, I think it's 75% of their congregation to register and vote that are voting age. And they know which churches to go to that are more likely to vote Republican than Democratic. And so they have weaponized the churches legally. I mean, there's nothing illegal about this. They have weaponized the churches. And I can remember as far back as 30 years ago, there were churches in this town that were handing out voter guides telling you who to vote for. Uh, and so what, what they're doing is now they're going at particular churches, giving them voting lists of people in their church and with personality profiles saying uh, they want uh, that to happen. There is a huge, large network. It's almost like a mere society. This is not the regular society. This is the Christian National Society, and they are almost mere opposites of one another, and they exist side by side in the country. They are a network of publishing houses. There's a there's something that goes on, and I. I I was talk, uh, listening to one of the writers of one of these books, and they said, what happened was the evangelicals or the Christian nationalists couldn't get their stuff published through the normal means. Abington Press wasn't going to publish them. Pilgrim Press wasn't going to publish them. So they created their own publishing house. But they didn't know how to get rid of them or sell them, so they started planting Christian bookstores in towns small and large all across the country so they could sell these books there. And if you go into a Christian bookstore, you'll find very few books that are written by major denominational publishing houses. They are almost all written by a small community and a small group of people. And what they say themselves is that if they don't toe the line, those publishing houses won't put those books in the bookstore and they will not be printed. Does that make sense? You see, so, so if you, uh, there was, they give examples of people who went out, colored outside the line and, uh, they, are, they said what they were called put in the wilderness. Their books were no longer sold at, at Christian bookstores. So that means if you're going to a Christian bookstore, you're getting probably some well-written books, but it is a narrow slice reinforcing uh, what we're going to be talking about in just a second. Two more quick things. More than any other religious demographic in America, white, and that's important. And by the way, blacks do not, at a 75% rate, even though they are evangelicals, will not identify as evangelicals because of the white supremacy that is in the normal evangelical. Uh, Statistically, white evangelical Protestants, again, not everyone, I will make clear this, they support preemptive war, condone the use of torture, and favor the death penalty. They are more likely than members of other faith groups to own a gun, to believe citizens should be allowed to carry guns, and to feel safer with a firearm around. White evangelicals are more opposed to immigration reform and have more negative views of immigrants than any other religious de demographic. Two thirds support Trump's border wall, 68% of white evangelical Protestants, more than any other demographic. Among evangelicals, high levels of theology, this, this one got me, theological illiteracy. They went through and looked at the books, and the books are biblically deserts. There's, there's quotes thrown in, but they're taken out of context. And, and, but the images that are used are uh, 
more militaristic. Uh, I've, I've got, for example, I can read if you want. Uh, uh, James Dobson ha- and, and two of his books has a, um, a thing about uh, parents. You have to whip your children. Don't do it with a hand, but use it with a paddle or a stick. Uh, and you should do it until they cry. Um, you know, and he's very well known, but uh, you can quote right out of his books. That's just an example of some of the paragraphs that are that are in there. They uh, they believe uh, healthy aggression is part of masculine design, and we are hardwired for it. There was a book called Wild at Heart. Does anybody know that one? It was, it was in the, I think, 80s or 90s. It went, it went, it was through, uh, it was 4 million copies were sold and it became one of the key books in men's groups and uh, so on uh, throughout the country. H- huge success, 4 million books. Uh, and one of the things that it says is, God is a warrior God, so man is a warrior. And said that they used as their examples uh, Mel Gibson's, uh, what's that, uh, Braveheart, uh, Fight Club, uh, uh, John Wayne. This is where John Wayne comes in. John Wayne was quoted over and over again. John Wayne was a philanderer. John Wayne was not a Christian. He was a raving racist. And if you listen to some of his comments, you wonder how he got away with making them. Uh, he said once that blacks should have equal rights when they get smart enough. You know, uh, and, and, and they use him as a model uh, for what it is to be a man. The, and what they do is they picture this man, I'm gonna try and wrap this up. What they do is they picture a man uh, the cowboy like John Wayne who rides into the town and by himself through redemptive violence, that's what it's called, uh, is able to clean up the town because the people aren't able to do it by self, but one person can come in and do it and they're strong. And so you start looking for that savior. You start looking for that Mel Gibson, that, that one man, who is that man going to be? And, and men are called to, to do that. Here's a quote from Tony Perkins. There isn't the slightest doubt about which way he expects pastors to tell their congregations. We are a divided nation and someone's values will dominate. Someone's values will dominate, important. He warns leaving little doubt who he's talking about. The rulers of darkness and the spiritual host of wickedness are to be found on the Democratic Party's side. That's a direct quote. And there are lots of those quotes like that. Well, tell me, how do you sit down and have an intelligent conversation and reach some sort of a compromise if the other side really believes that you are one of the rulers of darkness and that you are a spiritual host of wickedness, and that you are coming from hell. How, do you see what I'm saying? You start calling people that. If you believe it, how do you have a, a conversation? And, and that's, that's why this name calling really, really upsets me. I don't care who you are, left, right, middle. Name calling breaks down communication almost totally. How do you sit down with somebody who's calling you stupid and ugly and, and evil and, you know, all that sort of stuff? How do you do it? It's hard. And, and, and Tony Perkins goes on to say, we've captured the Republican Party. 30% of the Republican Party are now Christian nationalists. And that's a big enough group so that they can control primaries. And if they can control primaries, they believe now they have the Republican Party under their control. 
The Republican Party today is not the Republican Party 20 years ago. And I know that's controversial, but Christian nationalism is a belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity. The government should take active steps to keep it that way. Christian nationalists believe that the Christianity should be an enjoy privileged status in the country. You cannot separate Christianity from American identity. So if you're not a Christian, you can't truly be a full American. Christianity, that's in a Christianity Today article. You cannot separate Christianity from, uh, excuse me, that quote comes from Christianity Today. The belief that American nation is defined by Christianity and the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Christian nationalists believe that Christianity should enjoy a privileged status. You cannot separate Christianity from American identity. Biblical law. Christian nationalists take that all laws should be taken directly from the Bible. They should be, be biblical laws. Which ones? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm serious. Which, okay, biblical law, which ones? The ones that you're supposed to, uh, if somebody does something, you're supposed to cut off their heads. And uh, I mean, it's, it, I don't think it would be that, but that one of the things that is runs through this. And again, I want to say this form of evangel evangelism, it, it, and I want to make clear, it's not everybody. I want to be absolutely clear and not all churches, not all evangelical churches is complementary theology. Now remember, go back to those three things. Christian nation, family, and strength. The theology of comp complementarianism, and it is a theology and it is taught. Men and women are equal before God, but there are very distinct roles. The man is the provider, the protector, and the warrior. The woman is a homemaker and the child bearer and is to receive protection from the man. Mature masculinity, a man has the responsibility to be dangerous and to protect the country and the family. A mature woman accepts the protection and she is glad that he is not passive. She is to feel herself enhanced and honored and freed by the caring strength of her husband. Asserting female submission is the will of God. It makes a biblical defense of patriarchy and gender di differences that should form the bedrock of militaristic Christian masculinity. Militaristic Christian masculinity. You ought to read some of this stuff. I mean, I, 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 I want to give it to my wife. Uh, uh, you're supposed to, if, you know, I, I'm serious, this, this is serious stuff. You know, there have been a lot of sexual indiscretions among evangelical leaders. Not, again, we had to be careful with that, but a lot of the really prominent ones. And what they tend to do is blame the woman. And I've got quotes in here from them saying, uh, let's see if I can find He believed that wives must, this is Billy Graham, must submit to the husband's authority. Graham acknowledged that this would come as a, say, a, a shock to certain dictatorial wives. And he didn't hesitate to offer the Christian housewife helpful views. When a husband comes home from work, run out and kiss him. Give him love at any cost. Cultivate modesty and delicacy. Be attractive. Keep a clean house and don't nag and complain all the time. A man was a man was a representative, the spiritual head, the protector, and the provider of the home. And he should bring his wife a box of candy and flowers from time to time. Okay. 
Uh, this comes from this from Jim Dobson. This is a quote from his book, Love Must Be Tough. He warned women who deliberately baited their husbands into hitting them, verbally antagonizing them until they got the prize they sought, a bruise that they could parade before their neighbors, friends, and law to gain a moral advantage and perhaps justify an otherwise unbiblical marriage to, through divorce. That was in 1996 he wrote that. Females are to submit as the will of God. One of the reasons you spank your children is to teach them obedience. Because if they're not obedient to you, they won't be obedient to God. And they won't be obedient to their pastor. A biblical defense of patriarchy and gender differences form the bedrock. Masculinity was defined by the ability to accept danger, to protect women, and support the Second Amendment rights to bear arms. Well, if you're the protector, that would be the next step, right? You, the purity culture, there was a culture stringing standards together, female sexual purity. I remember I had a pastor come to my house and he asked me how I was treating my wife. And I said, pretty well. And he said, uh, where do you go to pick out your wife's clothes? I said, I said what? He says, well, I, I'm, I want to make sure my wife is dressed properly. So I go into a store and I pick out three or four dresses and then she can choose from them. Serious. I, said, mm -hmm. I, I want to tell Judy that. Uh, uh, that would cause a divorce. Uh, it, it, it has such phrases as, and you'll see them, Jesus loves me and my guns. It is not just the rhetoric that is seeking here or the fact that it could have been lifted straight out of dozens, uh, if not hundreds of books on evangelical masculinity. A common sense of embattlement and entitlement also links rhetoric of the NRA to that of conservative white evangelicals. You know, I once um, did a sermon on the images of Christ and found online uh, the NRA Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> two years into Trump's presidency, two thirds of the evangelicals did not think the, the United States had the responsibility to accept refugees. A poll revealed 12% of evangelicals cited the Bible in their primary influence. They came to be thinking about why immigration was immoral. Well, I could go on and on. This is the one I want to end with, though. American evangelicals have also forged ties with Vladimir Putin. Does this sound interesting? I, I, this shocked me, who is known for flaunting a bare-chested masculinity and with conservative elements in the Russian Orthodox Church. In 2014, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association magazine decision featured Putin on its cover. And Franklin Graham praised the Russian president for standing up to those gays and lesbians agenda. I could go on, but let's stop right there. Um, I'd like to apologize earlier for the some of the confusion what was going on early on. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate that uh, for those people on Zoom, if you contact the office, if you want the handouts, Judy will get them out to you. Uh, do we have any comments online to speak of? How many do we have online? I'm just curious. And I, I realize what some of the stuff I said is very controversial. I want to 
make it clear that it comes out of these books. I'm I'm not making this up, and I'm not necessarily even supporting all of the things that I I've said. Uh, but this is uh, any questions? Is it possible that uh, Kennedy could have? <laughs> is it possible that John Kennedy could have been elected uh, in this era? I have no idea. It sounds like. Uh, 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 well, it's uh, the, the, the well, that's but uh, you know, uh, you you've been tied into the evangelical community. There isn't the, there isn't like a Vatican, you know, a place where you can go. There are large, super mega churches. There are publishing houses. They are on television, on radio. Uh, they saturate all of the media, which is not illegal. And, and I'm not even complaining about it. They have every right to do that. But, they, but one of the things that happens, and, my, my, and I, I know several people who are like this, and I know it on both sides. I know people who watch Fox News, uh, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. I know people who watch MSNBC eight, 10 hours a day. Um, uh, but, if, but if you're getting this singular message from across the board, uh, and, and then Trump is the hero. He's the cowboy who comes in, who's, who's, who's doesn't get pushed around, who calls people's names, steps on people, you know, grab them by the, you know, uh, I can treat women any way I want. Well, he's not modeling something far different from some of the teaching of militant uh, evangelical uh, Christian nationalists. And I think the term is, I, I, I hate having to use the word evangelical, because it's a good word, and evangelicalism is a good. I, I want to stick to Christian nationalists, if I can. It's a little more complicated and harder to say, but people who, who want to protect this nation and make sure it remains pure. But who defines pure? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Hmm.